Four words put together that drive me crazy. These things take time. It's not that they are not appropriate in many contexts, but when I hear them in relation to diversity in our boardrooms, I say, oh yeah, this is taking a powerful amount of time. Our expectations are still the same. Our processes are still the same. So there's no surprise then that our outcomes are still the same. 20 years later, we are still talking about what we do not have in our boardrooms. When it comes to boards, it is about time. It's not about taking it. It's about time to give, it's about time to share, and it's about time to support. In this talk, I will share with you why I do what I do every day and why it matters to me. And how others can give their time, how organizations can share the time, and the role we all have to play in bringing a profound change to our boardrooms. I had a kidney transplant two years ago, and thanks to my brother Sean, who gave me the gift of life, I was able to make a number of commitments at that juncture, and I'm going to share three of them with you. One, that it's time for me to give back to our health service. I had had 44 years of tremendous health care, and I was going to do that by putting myself forward for a board within our health and social care family. So I did that. I made a number of applications, but I was appointed to one of our health trusts. The second commitment that I made was that every year, Sean would receive from me on our anniversary a bottle of craft gin. <laughs> Apparently that's going down particularly well. And the third commitment was that I would get going on doing my bucket list, and more on that later. You see, we all have a civic responsibility. These are challenging and changing times. Our public sector is under immense pressure. Our third sector is delivering more and more for government. And you see us, the public, we're demanding more. At the same time, investment in our services is decreasing. There's never been a better time than right now for a call to action, for more people to come forward, turn up, and play your part. Have you ever listened to the radio, read something in the newspaper, or watched the news and said to yourself, what on earth are they talking about? And what kind of a decision was that to make? Have you ever wondered why our health and social care waiting lists are so long? Have you ever wondered what it was like for a family who had just received a dementia diagnosis and what support they were going to get? Have you ever wondered why so many of our young people were taking their own lives? And have you ever wondered what our policing and justice system was doing about crime against our older people, against women, against our LGBT community, and against our migrants and refugees? Have you ever wondered why we have not stopped cancer yet? And have you ever been stopped in your tracks and cried hard because you were listening to the personal harrowing account of the impact of a decision taken by others had been on someone? You see, if any of these have triggered a thought or emotion for you, my question is simply, what part can you play? We all know the grumpy person that be on the radio most days to tell us that our roads are bad, our buses aren't on time, our health service isn't delivering, and quite possibly our politicians aren't doing a good job. They keep telling us that they have ideas. Apparently they're the biggest ideas in the country. <laughs> but we need more than ideas. Ideas alone are not going to, to address this. I watched as mom and dad grew older, and I watched the vulnerability and the frailty kick in, and I watched how others started to treat them differently, without dignity and without respect. Mum took critically ill, and that set us as a family on a journey together. Now, in our house, we have a nurse and a paramedic, and that helped us with some of the understanding, which was great and maybe prepared us a bit in relation to what may or may not happen next. But I began to wonder what it was like for other families going on that journey. 
And what was it like for other older people who did not have that family structure? Where was their support? Who was their advocate? And where was their voice? I wondered what I could do. I saw a small ad in the newspaper for a charity called AGNI. They were the voice of older people. They provide services and support. They were looking for a number of trustees and they had a list of skills that they, had to, that they wanted. I went down it. Ah, there's one I can give them. So I applied and I was appointed. You see, there's no better way for me to help our older people than to give my time, share my skills, and support the organization that is there to deliver for them every day. You see, the difference here is that I did something about what matters to me, and that's a choice that we can all make. In the pursuit to enable and empower others to come forward and take up these roles, I often hear about the practical, practicality of giving time. People work full time, they have caring responsibilities, and the meetings may be during the day. So what do we do? How do we address this? And the, the, the people themselves are telling me they want to turn up. We know I have evidence that they want to turn up. They're telling me that they want to play their part to a cause or a service that matters to them. But guess what happens? They rule themselves out. The only decision that we have to make when we see that ad is the decision to apply. After that, it's up to somebody else. You know, all we need to do is show that we want to play our part and turn up. Now, as we move forward, we ask people to say what it is that they want to do and why it matters to them. When I met Chris, he said to me that he wanted to play his part. He was 22 and he was from a law firm in Belfast. And he wanted to, to contribute to a board. And he was, uh, he was attached to a, an initiative to bring young professionals uh, to arts and cultural sector boards. Now, Chris's organization gave him the time. They allowed him to attend training before he was appointed. They allowed him to take the time to attend the board meetings, and they allowed him to get the time to attend events and activities that were important for that organization. You see, they got the importance of the time of sharing those skills with that organization. The importance for Chris in his development, the benefit for the charity, and in turn, the benefit from them as the organization. Now, for Chris, he was able to share his skills with us, and I was able to work with him and mentor him for four years. And in that time, he was able to take skills that he learned with us back to his workplace. And when he did that, he was growing and developing, and he grew and developed that much that within the four years of his time, that he became vice chair of the charity that he was attached to. And in his job, he was promoted to director within that legal firm. See, that's what happens. It's a bit like giving a, um, for employers, it's a bit like giving, um, uh, it's a bit like giving a secondment, thank you. It's a bit like a secondment. They get, to, they get to share their skills and expertise in that environment, okay? At a strategic leadership level, which they don't get the opportunity to do in their work. They get to share their skills and they get to learn new ones and they get to bring them back to the workplace. So employers, there's no better way to develop your staff than be able to enable them to take on strategic leadership roles in other organizations. Now our politicians get a tough time but in regards to diversity in our boardrooms, it's one thing that they're very clear on. They want to see more people from all walks of life coming forward. They want our boardrooms being more reflective of the society that they're there to serve. And they want more people involved in decision making at a local and regional level. Now we have in, in, this, uh, in Northern Ireland the potential of 60,000 board positions. We need many people to turn up every year to replace those roles. 
But how can we enable people to do that? Because the expectation is that we will turn up with a basket of skills and knowledge and tucked neatly under our arm will be a boardroom experience. How do we enable and empower them to engage at a level that is right for them? How can we be sure that when people look into the boardrooms, they can see themselves in there? We're all different. We don't all need to look the same or be the same or act the same. The more different we are in the boardroom, the better. When, the, when I was recruiting for the HNI Board of Trustees, what came up time and time again was people willing to give their, their skills and their knowledge, but they didn't have the experience. And I knew it just wasn't in relation to HNI. I knew this was happening across other boards in the public sector and in our third sectors. So what can we do? I had the conversation with our board, and we said that what we would do is we would have an initiative where we would create a board apprentice position and allow people the opportunity to learn the job whilst in a safe environment. Neil, who was our apprentice this year, provided such uh, enthusiasm and creativity in our discussions and debates around our board and committee tables. He provided real added value to what we were doing as an organization. And he was able to get us to think differently and do things differently with the short amount of time that he, st he stayed with us. You see, it's a win-win situation because all Neil needed was the opportunity to learn the mechanics of being in a boardroom and then being able to have the confidence and build that up, to speak up in the room at the table. You see, we can't expect people to turn up if we don't support them to do so. There's a culture shift that is needed here in relation to our boardrooms. They need to operate differently and do things differently. We don't necessarily need qualifications to be in the boardroom, but what we do need is curiosity. We do need commitment and we do need courage. Our government, our public sector and our third sector are all having to work differently now. So it's time our boardrooms did the same. Now, it's nearly time for me to head back to the boardroom, but I want to suggest to you that how's about together that we can create the pathways to enable and empower others to engage at a level that's right for them? How about together that we can ensure that every young person leaving school and college is clear that they have a role to play in our boardrooms throughout all of their lives, not just this part? How's about together we all start to have the conversations with our family and friends and our colleagues? And when they say that there's something that matters to them, we say, and what part can you play? How's about together we say to government, you know what, we'd love to turn up, but stop expecting us to turn up without the support to be able to do so. And how's about together we dispense with the perceptions and the myth and we create the boardrooms of the future. You see, if there's something that really, really matters to you and you want to play your part, well then why don't you come and join me and we can do this change together. Do you remember the bucket list? The item that says Eileen do a TEDx talk. <laughs> I think that one's done now. Thank you. Thank you.